But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf, its leaf will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord God, because of your promise good towards your children. We thank you, Father, that uh, you are indeed a good God, a God who can be trusted. So, Father, we pray this morning, Lord God, that we will experience your presence in our separate homes or wherever we happen to be. That, Lord, we will know that you are indeed a good God. And that, Father, we'll give our praise to you because of the experiences we have. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 <clears throat> so I'd like to say a welcome to everyone to International Christian Fellowship Manoway Boromwood on this lovely day of 7th of June 2020. Um, this service may be recorded to comply with GDPR, so if you do not want to be identified, on the recording, please switch your video off before the service commences. Um, at this point in our service, I'm going to go into communion, um, where we partake of the bread and wine. So as I was preparing for communion this morning, I, um, I'd like to draw attention to God's plan. That's what the Spirit laid on my heart when I was praying and seeking God's face about what his plans are for, for us. And it suddenly dropped in my spirit to Google what God's plan is and see what the world thinks God's plan is. And so I Googled and Wikipedia says that God's plan is the will of God it's the divine will, which I was quite pleased about to see that they, did, they said that. Or God's plan is the concept of a God having a plan for humanity. And I thought, yeah, God had a plan for humanity indeed, but humanity failed by disobeying God. So Adam and Eve were God's plan, God's original plan for humanity. They were created to commune with God, but they disobeyed and failed God. But God still loved his creation, so he decided to come himself, to redeem us back to him. He sent his son Jesus, well, we know Jesus and God the Father are one. So God himself, God himself came down from heaven to become an atonement for our sins, for our failings. It meant he had to go through a gruesome death where his body was broken and his blood was shed for us on the cross. His plan also included victory over death. Our Lord resurrected and went back up into heaven. Our Lord had to go through that gruesome sacrifice for us. This is why Jesus in the Last Supper asked us to remember. Remember, remember. Remember his sacrifice by breaking bread and wine when we meet together as a sign of unity, as a sign of togetherness. And so that we don't forget what he did for us on the cross. As the, as the bread represents his body that was broken for us, the wine represents his blood that was shed on the cross. Let's read from Luke chapter 22, verses 19 to 20, which is what the Lord Jesus um, said on the night he, he had the last supper with his disciples. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is Jesus saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, 
Again, Jesus is saying this. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. A new covenant. A new covenant is a new agreement, a plan that Jesus will become an atonement for, all us, for us all. He will become our covering. He will become our shield. He will become our savior. So this morning, as you take the bread and wine, which I hope everyone has their bread and wine ready, remember that Christ's death was for a purpose, which is much bigger than anything. It was not for nothing. It wasn't for nothing. It's all part of God's plan. God's plan to redeem us to himself and to save us and to give us eternal life. So this morning, let's thank God that we are part of God's plan. Let's take some time to thank him for that ultimate sacrifice that he came down himself from heaven just to become an atonement for us. And let's take some time also to pray for any of our family members, any of our friends who don't know this plan, who don't know about this, who need to be a part of God's plan. God is constantly knocking on the door of our hearts. Let's pray that they will answer the call. Let's pray that they will turn their eyes to Jesus so that they can be part of this awesome plan that we are in. So I want us now to just take some time to pray quietly in our hearts for those ones, those friends or family member that we've been praying for for ages, that God will soften their hearts and open the eyes of their understanding so that they can understand what it is to be in God's plan. Let's just take a few minutes to pray. Yes, Father, we just thank you this morning for our brothers and sisters that we've laid out this morning that is in our hearts that we're seeking for them to be a part of your plan, Lord. Father, for each and every one that has been prayed for this morning, Lord, I pray, God, that you would open the eyes of their understanding Lord, that you would soften their hearts. That, Lord, as you knock on the doors of their hearts, Lord, that they will hear it and they will invite you in, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will answer all our prayers this morning, Lord, that our families, our friends, Lord, that they will come to know you as their Lord, as their Savior. And Father, we're praying in agreement this morning your children are seeking and they're, and they're asking, Lord, that you answer this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord, we also thank you for your body, which was broken for us. Your body that sanctifies us. And your blood that was shed for us, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And Father, we thank you that you saw it fit to come yourself to redeem us. And Lord, as we partake in the bread and wine this morning, we ask, Lord, that you be with us this morning. Inhabit the praises of your people this morning, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for the finished work on the cross. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us eat and drink. Amen. I invite Pauline to lead us in worship. It's lovely to be here with you all again, be it, albeit virtually. We saw our grandson at a distance last week. And he said it was so lovely to see us inhuman. Aww. <laughs> Bless him. So we, we're going to sing, I don't have to know how to pray. All I have to know how to say is Jesus. And then we're going to go into a time, and then we're going to sing, draw me close to you. You're all I want, draw me close to you. And then we're going to go into a time of prayer. So that's the time when you pray, okay? <laughs> Yeah. And then we'll finish off with by your sign and then we'll have the, the Bible reading. It's so hard, isn't it, to, pr to, to really come into worship in your front room. But let's do it anyway, eh? Yeah. Break through this morning. Because if we don't connect with Jesus, there is absolutely no point. So. You don't have to know how to pray.
Lord, as we come to you this morning, we just want to tell you how much we love you. Mm. And Lord, we want to thank you, thank you for all that you are mm. and all that you've done. Mm. And Lord, as we come to you this morning, we just pray, Lord, that we may experience your presence. Mm. Lord, you said when two or three are gathered together, and Lord, we just want to come into your presence this mm. morning and just know that you're there with your arms around us. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you and lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 somebody wants to pray out loud, they probably should just signal to us. <coughs> Thank you, okay. Yes, Lord, I just want to um, praise you because we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, oh God. I just praise you, oh God, that um, you took your time, oh God, to create mm. us, oh God. Father, you thought about us, O oh God, and, and you made us, O oh God. You, you prepared us, O oh God, for this world, O oh God. Father, your word says that you know the very number of hairs on our heads, O oh God. Father, you know when we cry, you know when we smile. You know every thought, O oh God, that goes through our heads, O oh God. Father, you care for us deeply, O oh God. You're, 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 you're particularly, O oh God, concerned about us. Father, Father, because of it, O oh God, we just cast all our cares on you. We cast everything that is going on, O oh God, in the world into your hands because we know you are in perfect control, O oh God. Mm. We pray that your name will be exalted today, Father, as we lift you up today, Father, Lord God. I pray, O oh God, that you would draw us closer and closer to you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us, for all humankind, <clears throat> whoever we are, our temperament, whatever sins we commit, whatever the color of our skin. I want to thank you that, Lord, you died for each and every one of us. Mm. No one is exempt and that there's no inequality with you. Your blood was shed for all of us. Thank you. Thank you that your word in Matthew says to us, are we weary? Are we heavy burdened? We should come to you and find rest. Mm. I want to thank you, Lord, that in you we find peace. In you we learn how to live peacefully. The events of the last couple of weeks, Lord, has weighed so much on some of us. And I pray that for those of us who are overwhelmed by it, Lord, you will cause us to continue to look at you afresh and seek wisdom to know how to bring peace, gentleness, love, to heal the wounds of many and to correct Hallelujah. injustices. Yes. I pray for our leaders that they will seek to hear your voice and to take action to bring peace by acting in a just way for those who are oppressed in society. I pray for each of us as individuals to bring peace wherever we are, in our workplaces, in our churches, in our homes. Mm. We will be known as the people who seek to right the wrongs, who do not turn a blind eye. We will be known as the peacemakers. Father, mm. I pray that indeed you cause us to shine brightly in whatever little corner you've put us, that we'll do our bit to mm. bring peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Keep it, Hebe, keep your head up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we thank you, Lord, that. Um, we are those, part of those that are chosen to know you. We thank you, Lord, that today we are reconciling to a holy and righteous God. We thank you, Lord, that the Spirit of God lives in us, that the privilege of sonship, this privilege of royalty in heaven, 
now belongs to us. That we're today heirs of the kingdom and joined heirs with Yeshua, the son of Yahweh. Father, be glorified in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, your grace is abundant in our lives. And we come this morning, Lord, as people called of God. And we're asking and praying, mighty God. Oh, Lord, focusing, looking at the cross, looking at the precious blood that was shed, looking at the eternal sacrifice for humanity that was made a Calvary. And we say, Father, Lord, how else can we thank you? How else can we express the depth of appreciation for that which was done for us? And Father, Lord, that that opened the gateway for us to touch the throne of God in prayer. Oh, Father, just be glorified in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, we're praying and asking. This morning, Lord, that as, as humanity, as humanity is under pressure, as wounds are open, oh Lord, as a consequence of what is going on in the world, mm. mighty God, merciful God, cause us to remember the word of, your, of our Savior. Cause us to remember the word of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who said, if you do not forgive those that are hurting you, my Father in heaven will not forgive you. Father, Lord, many are scarred, wounds are open, you know, and the issue of racism is out there. But we're praying and asking, mighty God, for hearts that will forgive those who are hurting others in the name of Jesus. Amen. That we will not be bound in hatred, that we will not be bound in revenge, we will not be bound in revulsion, we will not be bound in anger. But we will say today, and as we stand in the gap with many other children of God across the diaspora, we forgive those who are hurting us in the name of Jesus. We surrender all to God and we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, in our forgiveness, we are released of the pain. We are released, O oh Lord, of the scars. We are released of those things that constrain our relationship with you. Uh -huh. And we say, Father, Lord, your peace will reign in our lives in Jesus' name. And as my sister prayed, we'll be those that carry the peace of God. We'll be those that share the peace of God. That as you are Jehovah, Shalom, the God of our well-being, that Lord, that we will be well in the spirit. We will be well in our hearts. And the spirit of God would use us even to touch other lives at this time in the name of Jesus. <coughs> Father, Lord, we give you praise. We honor and adore you. We say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, Father, we thank you because... You are indeed God. You're a God overall. Father, this morning, we bring our leaders before you, the leaders of the world, Lord. Your word says that we should pray for people in authority. And this morning, as Rebecca prayed, Lord, I want to add that you bless the leaders, Lord, all over the world with the issue we're being faced at this point in time. Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom and you give them good knowledge of what they should be doing at this time lord i pray lord that you have men and women around them who bring good counsel to them lord who would give them the good good advice and good uh, um, suggestions and opinions lord lord to to right the wrongs that are going on in our society lord i pray lord that the leaders will be men of valor the men of value and men who do things that are right lord and i pray that it that when any leader does something right, Lord, that other leaders will emulate and follow suit, Lord, to bring peace in our world today, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Roger. Either a so Has any 
word of interpretation for the tongue that OJ has given, please raise your hand and I'll unmute you. If you have any word, prayer. Amy? I think the only thing that keeps coming to my mind is let justice roll down like waters. Let justice roll down like waters. And I was just looking at it and um, it looks as if it's a word that comes from Amos. Um, that's the only word that's coming to my head. Uh, let justice roll down like waters. Amen. 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 The Spirit of God says to us uh, today that I love my humanity. I love the humanity I created. That the broken parts and the broken pieces will not surpass the love I have for humanity. I'm a God of justice, yet my love would reign. My love would heal. My love would set apart. My love indeed would manifest and continue so to do, even in these troubled times. I love the humanity I created. Mm -hmm. I love the humanity I created. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. Um, a verse came to mind as um, OJ was given the tongue. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, mm. and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. 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 Yeah. Henry, can you repeat the, the, the verse again? Micah 6, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. The Spirit is one. Amen. And we know our God is a God of justice. Mm. So we leave it to Him. Amen. 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 Anyone else have any word for the church? Olin, go ahead. I feel the Lord is saying, I see your pain. I felt your pain. I've taken your pain upon me. And although those pin pricks, those constant pricks hurt, the Lord would say his love is sufficient. His love is sufficient mm. and he will bring peace mm. and joy and love through the form. Mm. Amen. I believe he would say, keep your eyes on him mm. because if you start looking in other places, mm. you will find confusion. Mm. Yeah. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. We sing by your side, I would stay. In your arms, I would lay. Mm. Jesus, lover of my soul, nothing from you I withhold. Lord, I love you and adore you. What more can I say? You cause my love to grow stronger with every passing day. Mm. By oh, your side. screen today. So the first reading, I'm going to do it in two parts. <laughs> the, first, the first two are Matthew chapter, six, chapter 12 verses 1 to 16. So Matthew chapter 12 verses 1 to 16. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple pro profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means... I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. And great multitudes followed him. 
and he healed them all. And yet he warned them not to make him known. And then Matthew 13, 53 to 59. <clears throat> 53 to 58. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. So they were astonished and said, where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? <coughs> so they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's now time for us to bring our notices um, for the church. Um, as we're all socially distancing, I'm sure um, things people think that things will be ground to a halt but things are still happening within the church um social distancing notwithstanding um we're still serving god together in various ways in various platforms that we can inspire met on friday and i believe they had a fantastic time because the kids didn't stop talking about it um and so if you have any youth in your household they should be attending inspire Okay, it should be attending all the groups. At this time, we all need to come together, you know, not just adults, the children need to come together to just, you know, have fellowship and have a, a, a fun time with each other. So please, I urge you, if you have any youth in your household, only an hour, an hour, two hours. I mean, the kids, after two hours, they were still raring to go. So, you know, it's not, it's not about time, it's just, urge your children to join the groups. It's really, really important for fellowship, for building them up and for, you know, edifying one another in that age, age group. So please do encourage your children to attend. Um, the men had their prayer fellowship yesterday, I believe. The first time in ages. Um, so I'm sure it was a powerful time for you guys. Um, Yes, and there's cell groups going on in various households as well. So I'll just share our announcement for that. Shouldn't have done that. Okay, so just share the announcements. So we have ladies prayer breakfast next Saturday. June 13th at 10 a.m. And it will be Catherine and Kristen, I believe, are hosting us. So, Catherine, you are the host for Saturday. Um, cell meetings are carrying on in um, households. So, in my household, Obi and I, we have our cell every Wednesday at 8 p.m. And we've had a good, quite a good turnout every Wednesday. It's been a, a blessing. Um, Henry and Rebecca, they meet every Thursday. Um, at 8.15 after clapping for NHS. Um, I believe that's been going on every Thursday as well and been a blessed time for those who attend. Um, we continue to have our youth service every Sunday at 11.15. Um, so at some point, I think Rebecca will be going off to um, host the children in the youth service this morning. And I think that's about it for announcements. Um, and it's time for testimonies. Should we kick it off with birthdays? Who has birthdays in June? Philip. OJ. 
David. Philip. Philip. Anyone else? So let's sing for Philip, OJ, and David, who have a birthday this month. No, for me, it's for uh, Sophie. Oh, Sophie, Sophie. Where is Sophie? <laughs> Should we sing a happy birthday to them? Um, it's gonna, if I unmute everybody, it's not gonna sound very good for them. So you might just have to just listen to my voice. <laughs> Let's go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Philip, OJ, and Sophie. Happy birthday to you. Any more testimonies? <coughs> Rebecca. Yeah, um, I just want to thank God. He cares about um, our every, you know, what we think maybe, yeah, in infinitesimal stuff, God cares about it. Um, Ruth had a, an appointment at uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital, and so I was uh, to take her, and initially I just didn't want to take the car at all. I just was feeling I don't want to be going, you know, into central London uh, driving. So it was easiest just to go by tube um, because once you come out of Old Street, it's just three minutes walk and you're there. We got to the um, tube stations and we just stood there for about five minutes. The tube was still not moving then and eventually so the fire at um, uh, Golders Green. Uh, so there's an investigation. So they won't move until um, <laughs> it's sorted. So we waited for about another 10 minutes or so, and I thought, oh gosh, you know, we've got this appointment, we need to hurry up. So I spoke to my other daughter who said, why don't you, let, let me drop you, say, in Hampstead, because I'm still adamant, I don't want to drive. And then, which is beyond um, Golders Green, so you can then take the chief from there. She then checked online and it still said, um, there too, there's an issue. So I thought, God, why are you wanting me to just drive when I don't want to drive? I mean, <laughs> what's this? Okay, but so in the end, I had no choice but to drive. Um, and when we got there, as I expected, <laughs> finding a place to park is such a nightmare. Everywhere you go, it's, you just can't find anywhere at all to park. So eventually, I got her, you know, she, she got out to go to the uh, mall field herself. And I was just going around and, and I just went to one place and I said, God, I just want another testimony, please, on Sunday. Just get, find me a slot. And as God will have it, this big van, huge van, in a, a proper place where you pay. And um, I just thought, wow, this person just moved out. I parked there and I managed to join my daughter. So I just want to thank God that even the things that we think are just uh, infinitesimal, God still um, answers our prayer. Obviously, he wanted me to share this. So here I am. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Even the little things, he's in it. Praise God. Any more testimonies? Darren? Oh, oh sorry. Mute my, there we go, I'm trying yeah. to unmute myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, just, I just want to give thanks for the, uh, uh, the men's meeting yesterday morning. And it was just such a, such a good time uh, to spend with the guys. And I thought, um, David, our friend David Kagera, I mean, it's interesting how he says that he's not very always that confident in, you know, speaking out and leading, but he was excellent. And uh, it was a very simple question where he said, look at, you know, looking at the fruit of the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, etc. And just ask us which one, which one of those as men do we find uh, the most challenging in our own lives? And it was just, I just thought it was a wonderful time. And I know, I know I've said this many, many times. But the thing I appreciate about it when us guys get together is that there's no fakeness. You know, there's no fake, there's no sense of saying, you know, because sometimes, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to upset people, but sometimes people can be saying, Jesus has the victory and behind the scenes, their life is falling apart and they never say anything about that. Whereas actually, I appreciate it when men come together and they're honest with each other and they will say, 
you know, because actually when we, when we confess our brokenness, that's allowing the spirit in to heal us. And it was just a lovely, lovely time where we were just able just to share together and pray together. And I just thank God for that, uh, you know, that how it just brought us together and brought us closer. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well done, David. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. Do I have one? Oh, yes, I have one, actually. You just reminded me. So yesterday, um, when the kids um, started Inspire, was it yesterday? Friday, Friday night, when the kids started to inspire, um, Jasmine suddenly ran out of the room and held her chest and she came into the kitchen and I was like, what? She was like, you know, she, you could see in her face, she was in pain. She said, I can't, I can't. I was like, what? She said, pain, pain, pain. So I thought to myself, the kids have been looking forward to inspire for ages and then they've started and this just comes. And I went on her, I said, I banish you now in the name of Jesus. And immediately, Jasmine went, mom. She was like, mom, what are you? She was like, mom. The pain disappeared wow. instantly, wow. instantly. And she just went back to the room. And I was like, praise God. <laughs> praise God for the healing. Yep. Anyone else? No, I, I don't think so. Um, Pauline, I believe you have uh, more readings for us. I do. So, oh, it's from John. <coughs> so the first one is John chapter five, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son of God can do, no, no, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. And then John chapter 12, verse 49 For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And then chapter 14, verses 18 to 23. <coughs> I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? <coughs> and Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And then 16, 7 to 15. So John 16, 7 to 15. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I do not go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And then the last one, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we pray that you'll anoint your word. We pray, Lord, that you'll just help us with all the technological stuff. <laughs> and Lord, that you'll help us to understand what it is that you are saying. Amen. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Oh, yeah. We just had a bit of fun and games there when a, a little sign came up saying the battery was running flat. <laughs> Somehow it become unplugged. Goodness knows how these things happen. This morning, my, my theme I felt was launching out into the deep with the Holy Spirit and leaving the confines of conventional church meetings, the thinking behind them. Yesterday was um, a celebration of D-Day or remembrance of D-Day when people did something they'd never done before. Set out across the channel uh, with a weird harbour that they'd built to land on shores they'd never been to, to attempt to do something that had never been done before. And that's basically a situation which we're in with regard to the coronavirus, if you think about it. That um, we're in a situation which we've not been in before. And once again, I, I just feel that God's saying, okay, so new situation calls for new thinking, new approaches. It doesn't necessarily mean discarding all the old approaches. It just means that we've got to consider, are we doing things that we need to do? Are there things that we need to do that we haven't thought of? And... Um, one of the things that I noticed, I've been reading through Matthew, was how Jesus adopted and changed according to the people that he was meeting. Um, I noticed, for instance, there were times he spoke head on and out loud and in public condemning certain religious leaders and their attitudes. But there were other times when, for instance, he went up to the temple privately, secretly. And there were other times when he was public uh, and uh, he changed according to what was happening. And so in the first passage that Pauline read, uh, the disciples had been accused of breaking Sabbath laws. And Jesus pointed out how they hadn't and how that he is Lord of the Sabbath and how they've been falsely accused. And in the second one that Pauline read, uh, he'd actually been used to deliver somebody in a synagogue to heal him and the result of that was that people hated him and you know sometimes when you do good you you think that automatically somebody can say yeah thank you very much but there's always somebody who didn't like the fact that you were in the picture and they didn't like the fact that jesus was in the picture 
They didn't like the fact that he'd broken what they considered to be a rule. And one of the problems that we have, I think, is our concept of church for every single one of us will depend to a certain extent on our culture and our background. So in England, a lot of people might be thinking of an old building, a very old building, usually pretty cold, uh, with choirs and all the rest of it, whilst in some places they'll be thinking of an outdoor meeting underneath a tree, or in a village clearing, or in a tent, or by the seaside. So it depends on our background as to what we're expecting to happen within churches. But all of these things will have their own cultures and rules. And one of the things we've got to say to ourselves is, well, have we made a rule that we can't do something with regard to church services, either the time or the day or what they're like, that actually isn't based on scripture, isn't essential for every single service? And so Jesus, when he was restricted by the religious leaders, and unfortunately it usually is the religious leaders who restrict people, um, he actually left the synagogue. And the moment he left the synagogue, instead of there being one person healed, it says there were multitudes. Why? Because they followed him. They went outside of the box of where the religious people considered God could work. They launched out into the deep. A totally different situation, totally different setting. And uh, it would have been very easy for Jesus to just give up, but he didn't. And so when, for instance, he delivered somebody who was demon-possessed, they accuse him of being using the de devil's powers. And time and time again, people will accuse even Christians of doing things which they shouldn't do and ascribing it to all sorts of things which weren't the origin just because we have biases, background cultural views and our upbringing as to how a service should or shouldn't be and how Christians should or shouldn't act. And uh, Jesus had to refute these things uh, and to stand up and say, well, you do not determine who I am. And you do not determine my abilities. And we mustn't let people and their negative attitudes to us determine who we are and our abilities. God has given us abilities, even for this situation, to reach out to people. Jesus adapted his ministry. I mean, as we see, he went out to the lakeside and held huge meetings from a boat. I mean, come on, that's not how religious people do it. <laughs> and then on a mountainside and in the wilderness, getting people to follow him to the point where they, it, it says they were hungry and tired. That's a very long meeting. Now, some of you guys know that, for instance, I as an Englishman think an hour is quite a long time. Well, as for some of the people I know, but you don't even get going till you've been going for three, four hours in worship, and then you're just starting, and then uh, go on preaching. And um, we know that Jesus moved around. He didn't just say, well, I can only heal in this situation, but not in that. So for instance, he visits Peter's house, and Peter's mum is ill, and so he heals Peter's mum. And then, for instance, for Cornelius, uh, I think the Cornelius, no, one Cornelius, one, a centurion, he healed his servant just by speaking a word at a distance. And sometimes he only took three people with him. Now that would have sort of annoyed some of the others, wouldn't it? Why isn't he taking me? Sometimes he took 12 with him. Sometimes he had 70 plus. And so we've got to be willing to be flexible to follow the Spirit of God. It's so easy to get stuck in a rut of this is how it's been done. This is how it's always been done. And it's never going to change. And constantly Jesus said, I only do that which I see the Father doing. 
I only say that which I hear the Father saying. And so we've really got to listen to God. What is he saying? Now I'm going to say something which I hope will provoke us to think and challenge us. And I want to say that the good thing about the early church, and I'm talking right at the very beginning, is that they didn't have the scriptures and they didn't have church buildings and they didn't have church rules and therefore they had to really depend upon the Holy Spirit and how he led them. So it was quite a few years after Pentecost before you had the scriptures, what we know as the New Testament, in any circulation at all. Of course, the bad thing about that very early church was that it didn't have the scriptures and church buildings all rules and therefore some were claiming that they were following the holy spirit when they weren't following the holy spirit at all they were forbidding marriage some even called jesus accursed some were leading immoral lives and getting drunk and for instance that's the background to what you've just been talking about with communion 1 corinthians 11 that in their endeavor to follow god sometimes they did it wrong and sometimes you and i will get things wrong but we have to be willing to launch out into the deep the early church adapted to leading by the holy spirit up until the holy spirit was poured out and jesus had died then the holy spirit had been poured out they've been used to going to a physical person jesus and saying, what do we do today? And now he's gone. They've got to, God, what do you want me to do today? And, and that's totally different, isn't it? It's much easier for me to ring you up and say, what, what should I do about the situation? Than it is to sit here and pray and ask somebody I can't see, what should I do now? And, but that is basically the background to the church being led by the holy spirit they started in an upper room uh, and hiding away and then they start meeting publicly in their thousands in the local jewish temple the same temple where the same people would be going who'd been involved in crucifying jesus they could even be a few yards from you so one, uh, one part of you, you've got this little meeting going on with the disciples, uh, and yet at the same building, and it is a huge building, you've got others who are involved in crucifying Jesus. Uh, they met on riverbanks. They met in schoolrooms. They met in houses. And historical evidence even shows they met in caves. So there's all sorts of different settings. They didn't define themselves and say, well, this is the Jewish temple. This is what our buildings have got to look like. They went out. They launched out totally differently into where meetings should take place and what should happen. The early church was adaptive even when it comes to baptizing people in water. I want to ask you a question which there is no accurate answer that I know of. So you could spend days or the rest of your life wondering about it. But on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got converted on and they got baptized. Jerusalem is not by the sea. So, where did they get baptized? 3,000 people is an awful lot of people. You try baptizing 3,000 people in one day, you need an awful lot of water and an awful lot of people baptizing them. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem or anywhere like that you'll find that they have ablution tanks where the priests and other people converting to the faith will walk in one end walk through the water and walk, walk out again i wonder i cannot prove it but i just put it forward in order to baptize three thousand people in jerusalem that day they would have had to have used things like that they would have had to find whatever water was available it's true there's a pool at siloam but uh, 
I just bring that to your attention that there was adaption. They didn't say, well, we haven't got a church building, uh, so and we haven't got a river nearby, but they found a way to do it. And it would have been involved lots of different people, I would suggest, doing it in lots of different locations. And then you've got the fact of from not only them being baptized there, but for instance, Philip goes into an oasis with a, a, a eunuch. He's met him in the wilderness. <coughs> and, and the guy says, well, I, I need to be baptized. So baptism was part of the, the sermon on repentance. And, and Philip didn't say, well, wait a minute, we haven't got the church around us. He baptized him there and then. And then you've got uh, the jailer with Paul. He gets converted and it says he and his household were baptized. Where? I leave you to think about it, but I would suggest to you it probably happened at the jailer's house, at the jail itself. I don't know whether they had a big bath or a big water put or what, but they were baptized that night. They didn't wait for ages uh, to gather people together to do it. And it um, doesn't say particularly they went out, it doesn't say they didn't. I'm just saying, just think about it. They were willing to adapt and alter and get stuck in with what God was leading them to do. The early church followed the Holy Spirit doing whatever was required, however it was required, whenever it was required. And it must have been a real break for them. Can you imagine the challenges? They'd been used to meeting on a sab Saturday and going as a synagogue and not worshipping Jesus. And these people have got converted and now suddenly they're worshipping somebody who's been crucified. Suddenly they're all about somebody who's been crucified, not about lambs being sacrificed, not about priests in long black clothes and things like that, but a total different change, a real challenge for them. The church was adapting to being led by the Holy Spirit. And so now instead of the scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priest being the leaders of the organization, it's the Holy Spirit and people that he's putting in their path, pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists. The whole thing is, is turned around. It's totally different. Everything's become new. It's all, all strange experience. How do we react to it? What, where are the rules? We haven't got them. So you've got to lean to the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly also we've got these spiritual gifts. I mean, up till Pentecost, now we've been speaking in tongues. And now you've had thousands of them. And then you've got other gifts of the Holy Spirit being operated. Well, people are making mistakes. Yes, but they're actually trying to cooperate and learn from following the Holy Spirit. And so you've got Peter wandering off to break some laws and go and meet some people who you shouldn't be meeting because they're Gentiles. That's just not done in our church setup. But it is because the Holy Spirit's leading. You've got Philip who's quite happily ministering to this guy in the wilderness, baptizes him. And what? He's suddenly somewhere else. He's miraculously transported. Not only is he miraculously transported <coughs> from one place to another, but he tells people that that's happened. What's our reaction when we hear about people being miraculously transported? As I've heard, for instance, one person going into a toilet in an airport in one uh, country, and when he came out the door, he was in a totally different country on the other side of customs where he was to minister. These things are happening today. But because we tend to say, but that's not what we experience in our church. 
it's easy to write these things off. And so we've really got to launch out. I mean, not only you got these gifts being used, but people were being sent out as a result of prophecies. Separate Paul and Barnabas for the ministry. People were willing to prophesy and speak out. They went out proclaiming the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus is risen from the dead. And today, with the C virus attacking people all over the world, perhaps it's time for the church once again to realize that we have a ministry. Yes, we have a ministry to each other, which is very important, but we do have a ministry to outside, even while this virus is on and to adapt, perhaps add a service whereby we are reaching out, talking about the kingdom of God and how to be saved rather than that which might be more beneficial just to somebody who is converted already and part of a church. We are being challenged as far as I'm concerned to think outside of our conventional boxes outside of our previous experience. Jesus did things they did not expect to happen on the Sabbath. Perhaps the church needs to do things which people wouldn't expect it to do, including on the Sunday. Perhaps we need to adapt, add, alter services in order to reach more people to grasp what would previously have been thought of as unthinkable, to realize that we need to reach people and to reach them in a way that they can be reached. As I said before, friendship groups, you talked about cell groups, whatever groups, you know, even putting things like a short message for the week, and I mean short, five, 10 minutes, Two, three, yeah. My wife says two to three minutes. <laughs> but short message that, that non-Christians who will look at your website might pick up on. Oh, that was interesting. That was encouraging. But it has to be encouraging. Something to lift up the people who are feeling down. We once went to church on New Year's Eve, a church we didn't usually go to. And it was all about the horrors of the past year. And let's pray for them. I didn't go back to that church again. I want encouragement, not putting down and somebody stamping on my head and depressing me even more than I could have been before I attended. We need to grasp the unthinkable, adapt, challenge, I mean, there are other services which we can run than communion service to reach people. They are good for Christians, but do non-Christians want to attend a meeting like this for a long time? We need to think. We need to launch out into the deep and you never know what might happen. I mean, I, I, we could put things on the website like that vicar singing Amazing Grace, playing Amazing Grace on the street. You may have seen it, may have encouraged you, but has everybody? I can tell you the answer is no. Or the UK blessing with the people singing it from all around the world. You can stick that on your website. Or the one that particularly got me was the kids singing it. That got me even more. And, um, I mean, lots of people say, well, I've seen that dozens of times. Well, you may have done, but I only saw it recently. And there'll be non-Christians who won't have seen it. I'm just giving suggestions to think possibly what can we add. And to expect the unexpected. You know, I'm sure that Philip never expected to be ministering to somebody in that wilderness. He didn't know what was going to happen because the Holy Spirit led him there. No idea. 
that he ends up ministering to this guy, taking the opportunity that occurred before him. And then I would think, well, he'd be saying to himself, so what do I do now? Do I sort of start teaching him? No, he's off, taken away by the Spirit of God somewhere else to do something else. Launching out into the deep. I want to end with a little example. I'm going to use it. Patrick knows of this man too, George Brecken. In the early 50s, George Brecken was a farmer up in North Yorkshire and um, up at Pickering actually. And he was crippled. In fact, I think it would be in the 40s, late 40s rather than the early 50s. And he was crippled and in a wheelchair. And he was bored with life. And uh, we didn't have TVs in those days. We had radios. And we had radios with very few programs. Uh, and so he was sitting, twiddling the tuner on his radio, just trying to find something that would cheer him up. And I don't know whether it was Transworld Radio or Radio Luxembourg, but one of the very much smaller channels that was quite difficult to pick up had Oral Roberts on it, preaching. And as he listened to Oral Roberts, he turned it on just before the appeal. So not a long sermon. And at the end of the appeal, Oral Roberts said, now just lay your hand on the radio if you're sick while I pray for you and God will heal you. And you can guess what happened, can't you? God healed him. He got up out of the wheelchair totally healed and has ministered and both Patrick and I and Pauline and Patrick's late wife Ingrid have met him and uh, all because somebody was willing to use a media which was quite unconventional in those days church wise the radio and somebody was willing to say something what lay your hands on the radio no it says that you should lay hands on the sick it doesn't say you lay hands on the radio Somebody was thinking outside of the box, thinking, well, I can't be there in person, so what can I do? When um, names can help me more. Smith Wigglesworth went to Sweden. So many people were getting healed that the doctors bought a court order out that he couldn't lay his hands on them to pray for them. And so he did something that wasn't done. He said, if you're sick, put your hand on where you're sick and I will pray. And multitudes of people got healed. Thinking outside of the conventional box. I mean, he was unconventional to put it mildly. If you want to read about unconventional guy, read about Smith Wigglesworth and what he got up to. And it might be quite frightening and challenging as well. But all I'm saying is in this time, we can either say, well, you know, we're very restricted. I heard this morning, for instance, that the churches will be able to start opening up again uh, on possibly the 4th of July. But it won't be for meetings such as we know now. It won't be meetings like we had prior to this virus. So we're going to have to say to ourselves, okay, what do we need to do to adapt to the new situations which we're going to face then? And be prepared. Now the Holy Spirit knows. And he wants us to get on board. I pray that we will face up to the challenges before us, not with dread, but say, hey, this is a golden opportunity to say, God, okay, this is a new day. It's like we've been locked up in that upper room and things are going to be changing. Okay, God, how do we respond? And how do we respond even now to reach those people who at the moment are unreached? May God bless you and help you. Amen. Please, I'm handing over to Opie. Amen. Amen. Thank you for, your, for the word that you brought to us this morning.
I, I believe that the Lord is saying to us this morning that we need to actively seek to find out what he wants us to do. And so if there's anyone in the church who has any ideas or suggestions, please, please bring it to the leadership, share it. I know people watch videos online of different churches, what they're doing. If you have any ideas, any suggestions, bring it to the leadership. It's, it's not just for the leaders to, to go on this mission. We're all on this mission. So yeah. if we do actively seek God's face at this time, let him yeah. let us know what we are to do to respond to the current situation mm -hmm. so that we can adapt and we as a church reach out to more souls than we are currently doing. Yeah. Amen? Yeah, Amen. Amen. And I invite Patrick for the closing prayers. Patrick, are you there? Oh, maybe he's, he's muted. Hold on. <laughs> Patrick, you were muted. Start again, please. <laughs> there's, a, there's a problem with the internet. I don't know what it is. Anyway, let's pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, that's a tremendous promise, isn't it? The one who is able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with rejoicing. How powerful is our God to the only wise God, our Saviour. There's no one else who can save us but the Lord Jesus Christ. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless. Sorry for if I didn't hear your message, but uh, well, I heard ten percent, but <laughs> no I was going to say goodbye because of that. Uh,